ISIL's days in Syria appear numbered. The Islamic State of Iraq and Levant has lost almost all its territory and its fighters are on the run. But where will they go and will the threat from ISIL be over? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Parada. ISIL once controlled an area stretching from western Syria to eastern Iraq that is nearly the size of the UK. It proclaimed a caliphate in 2014 and imposed its harsh rule on millions of people, but it was flushed out of Iraq and eventually lost most of its ground in Syria. What's left of the group now is confined to a tiny part of the Syrian village of Baghouz, where they are vowing a battle to the death. The US-backed Syrian Democratic Forces, made up of mainly Kurdish fighters, has launched an offensive to retake the village, but it's not easy. Thousands of civilians have already been rescued from Baghouz, but more than 2,000 remain trapped. Well, ISIL began seizing control of territory in Syria in 2014 when it captured the key city of Raqqa and declared it the capital of its self-proclaimed caliphate. A year later, the group's control expanded to include most of Deir Azor, parts of Aleppo, Homs, and the province of Idlib, also area south of the capital Damascus, a vast stretch of desert and oil fields. But in 2017, US-backed, mainly Kurdish fighters, retook the city of Raqqa, and the Syrian army, with help from Russian airstrikes, regained full control of Deir Azor. The fall of these two key strongholds weakened ISIL, and they began to lose more and more ground. More than four years after the group's rise in Syria, all it has left is a tiny patch in Baghouz near the Iraqi border. Well, let's introduce our panel now. Joining us from Rabat, Morocco, is Mohamed Nasba. He's director at the Moroccan Institute for Policy Analysis. In Ankara via Skype is Yusuf Alabarda, a freelance security analyst at SETA, the Foundation for Political, Economic and Social Research. And in London is Mesa Gifford, a human rights activist and anti-ISIL campaigner. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Masba, I'll start with you in Rabat. Are we seeing the end of the group of ISIL in Syria? Uh, I think it's uh, from a military perspective. We think I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a successful and uh, a campaign to limit the uh, capabilities of uh, the uh, ISIS as a caliphate. And uh, we we have seen that many of the uh, f uh, its fighters has been killed and its uh, territory has been shrinked, etc. So it's from that perspective. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's been successful. But if we look for a long term, I think ISIS uh, is far away from uh, from being defeated because the appeal of mm -hmm. the uh, uh, of its ideology and its organization, I think. Uh, is uh, transitioning from the uh, state or from the caliphate into underground uh, or guerrilla uh, uh, way of, uh, of, of fighting. So it's very difficult to say that we are uh, any time soon of the end of uh, ISIS. Mr. Alabarda, does the end of the group, do you think, mean the end of the ideology? The group seems to be all but defeated in Syria, but has the ideology? From my point of perspective, I agree uh, with my uh, comrade that uh, he says that the ideology still keeps on, on this land because of the violence which has been created in Syria and Iraq and the historical background starting from uh, Assad regime and starting from Saddam Hussein time. Uh, the battle uh, or the field is very fertile in order to create uh, such kind of uh, terrorist groups uh, because of the, uh, when we take a look at back to the historical background of the ISIL. But, but what can I say that a guerrilla type warfare in order to conduct, especially in Syria and Iraq, is also impossible because in order to conduct a guerrilla warfare, you need to control an area which completely belongs to you for all kind of logistical and training camps. I can say that from now on, the ISIL can conduct terrorist attacks in or uh, just uh, very different from the guerrilla warfare, the terrorist attacks inside Syria and inside Iraq. So I agree that ISIL militarily 
uh, has lost the game in Syria and in Iraq, but I can say that is not the end of any kind of terror groups inside Syria and Iraq. All the Middle East terrain is very fertile, as I said, in order to create such kind of terror groups in this area. Mr. Gifford, do you think the group could resurface, given that there is no credible peace plan for Syria? And as we've heard, many of the conditions that led to the rise remain, you know, an absence of political legitimacy. We have a failure of governance still. Yes, I actually agree with my fellow guests that uh, although we've defeated ISIS militarily, uh, we've taken back their so-called caliphate, the, the sick, twisted ideology that underpins everything they do lives on. And while that lives on, while Syria and Iraq are still in ruins, and while people are still not represented in government, while they feel they don't have a future, I think you'll always find um, the rich, fertile ground for which ISIS will try to exploit. Um, and that's the next challenge for the coalition. The coalition mm -hmm. has done great work in destroying ISIS. However, they have destroyed a lot of uh, Syrian infrastructure, for instance. So we really need to rebuild. We need to restore what, what, what was there. And we also need to come up with a, a plan for the future that will actually heal uh, the rift within sort of Syrian society. And before you do that, I mean, how do you manage the very present problem right now of the remaining fighters? Uh, Mr. Masba, what are their options? You know, if they're Syrian, will they stay in Syria and try to reintegrate society or will they leave and keep on fighting? I mean, that's a, it's a big issue because uh, many countries, there is no agreement actually uh, among countries how to deal with the foreign fighters. In Europe, there is a hated debate how to deal with the, uh, with the foreign fighters or the returnees. And uh, as you uh, uh, followed all uh, recently, uh, President Ob uh, Trump asked the uh, European countries to uh, receive the uh, foreign fighters. But actually, there is a dilemma how to deal with this returnees. Uh, most of the European countries countries actually are not uh, welcoming or are not uh, enthusiastic to, to receive them. And uh, the uh, actual or the way they are most of countries in Europe and elsewhere are dealing with the uh, for, uh, returnees is a, uh, mainly through repressive measures, which is the prosecution and uh, putting right. them in prison. But the problem is not that it's not the prosecution, it's after the post-prison, because those people have experience in uh, the battlefield, and uh, it's uh, a challenge after they uh, return to society uh, later. And Mr. Alibarda, there are, of course, many who don't want to return to normal society. They want to keep fighting. What are the options for these fighters? Where are they looking to go? I mean, we've heard from Iraqi intelligence officials, from a U.S. military um, official, that hundreds, likely more than a thousand of ISIL fighters have crossed the open border, the desert border, into Iraq. Are ISIL already regrouping in Iraq? As I said, Iraq and Syria is a very fertile ground, as I said. Uh, in order to build up, again, a capacity inside Iraq. So it, we should be very, very careful, uh, not only in Syria, but also in Iraq. But in order to tame this terrorist organization, both inside and Iraq and Syria, we have three options, I can say. One of them is to let them turn back to their original countries and to make a judicial, uh, judicial trial in their original countries. The second option that to... Uh, judge them in the original countries where the crime has been committed. But when we take a look at back to the Syrian ground, for example, there is no uh, capacity of the Syrian government mm -hmm. in order to judge because the Syrian government only controls one third of its country. The two thirds of its country under the occupation of Syrian democratic forces and other forces. So this is also not very good option in order to fight with the terrorist organization. The third option, which is very uh, logical from my point of perspective, to build an international court and mm -hmm. to judge them inside uh, where they have committed their crimes. But that uh, court should be definitely an international court because we cannot try, we cannot trust to the judicial process of the Syrian regime uh, so uh, the third option might be a, right. a little bit uh, more, more logical. But what can I say that the European countries has explained in a couple of days that they cannot take back the responsibility of 
uh, accepting their citizens to their countries. We cannot fight against terrorism if we do not take the responsibility mm -hmm. of our citizens. So they should take some responsibility yeah. in order to fight against terrorism. Otherwise, preaching to the countries such as uh, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and other countries from their comfortable uh, rooms is not enough to fight with terrorism. And again, what happens to foreign fighters who want to return home, you know, is a real issue. But that's something that is addressed once we actually get to a judicial process with the fighters. Again, there are so many who don't want to, um, who don't want to return and who want to keep fighting. So, Mr. Masba, how concerned or prepared are countries in the region, you know, including North African countries, about the fighters who are losing ground in Syria, trying to make it to other countries in the region to join groups there? Uh, actually, uh, there are two different kind of countries in North Africa that are dealing with the, this issue. There are, I would say, strong uh, countries with uh, uh, strong uh, uh, capabilities at the military and security level, which I'm talking here about Morocco, uh, Algeria, and uh, to some extent Tunisia. So in this country, I think they are more efficient in dealing with the returnees and also managing the uh, er radicals. But uh, the issue here is with Libya, which which, where there is a lot of uh, uh, lawless areas, and uh, uh, there was a lot of people traveling from and to uh, uh, to Libya, uh, uh, foreign fighters. So here is a, an issue of how to deal with this uh, this uh, people uh, coming from uh, living Syria and Iraq and uh, locating into Syria. But to what extent and how many people traveled actually uh, to, to to Libya and? Uh, other countries, it's very difficult to uh, to judge for the moment. I think it's uh, more the case of the fragile and weak states rather than the strong uh, st uh, states like Morocco, uh, Algeria, and Tunisia. And of course, all of these countries are worried um, about the U.S. troop withdrawal from Syria because of what it means, you know, for the situation, fighting ISIL, for fighters leaving, and we've had. As we mentioned, President Donald Trump's announcement in December that he was pulling out 2,000 U.S. soldiers out of Syria raised concern among allies, alarmed the SDF. Turkey considers Kurdish fighters to be part of a terrorist group and would attack them once U.S. forces withdrew. The White House now says it's keeping 200 U.S. troops in Syria as peacekeepers, but Trump denies it's a U-turn, and his decision came after a phone call with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Turkey wants to set up a safe zone in northeastern Syria, which is cleared of the U.S.-backed Kurdish fighters. Uh, Mr. Gifford, I'll come to you because you've actually fought with the Kurdish YPG in Syria against ISIL. What are your thoughts on the, the US troop withdrawal, keeping these 200 so-called peacekeepers in the country? What are they going to do? Well, I think put themselves really between the Turkish army and the Kurdish YPG. Um, I was very disturbed to hear Donald Trump's initial suggestion that all troops were going to be removed. Um, I think Donald Trump is very much a short-term politician. He was, he was only there to fight ISIS. He wanted to pull all the troops out. But after some advice from his own generals and realizing that if he were to do that, then it would actually start another round of violence in Syria, that he's actually d taken the sensible option of keeping some troops on the ground. Because the real battle now is how do we keep the peace after we've defeated ISIS? And we've already heard that ISIS could actually come back. Mm -hmm. They have got um, arms supplies, arms dumps. They've got a real insurgency plan that they've formed for quite some time now. Uh, but also, how could we stop Assad uh, attacking? How can we stop Turkey attacking? How do we actually keep people around the table? And how can we get everyone around uh, the table in Geneva? So I think that those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. And that's the question I hope Donald Trump right. is considering now. And of course, another question that is frequently asked about the US trip withdrawal, Mr. Masbel, I'll put it to you, is how much of a vacuum is it going to leave? I mean, is it going to um, contribute to a regional, to an international power struggle, which in turn could make it easier for ISIL to come back? Yeah, I mean, uh, the question here is that, as, as uh, my, uh, uh, the, my colleague before said, it's the, this policy is short-sighted. It, it looks to the short 
uh, terms, but not on the root causes that led in the beginning to the emergence and the increasing influence of ISIS, which is the, a bad governance and also corruption of local elites. So after the withdrawal of the uh, American troops, what is the next uh, next plan? What is the next steps? I think there is a if. There is no uh, address of the root causes, which is actually uh, the bad governance and also corruption and mm -hmm. how to manage the daily life of people. I think it's going to make it easier for uh, a resurgent of uh, maybe not ISIS, but another group of jihadi uh, inside Syria and Iraq, because this is, I think, the main mm -hmm. uh, reason that has led to that uh, to that. Uh, a resurgence in the first place. So here again, we will uh, be in a vicious circle, which is a bad, cor bad governance, mm -hmm. corruption, and uh, a social appeal. And we have to know actually that many people in uh, during the caliphate, the the two or three years of the caliphate, were actually n not ideologically affiliated with ISIS, but they were happy because they at least provided security and the kind of order and the rule of law uh, in their way. I mean, the uh, caliphate, even if we don't like the way, uh, I mean, the beheadings, etc., but it successfully managed to put the order. So the question here is uh, if the next step is, to, is how to manage mm -hmm. the situation and to put things in order. If this is not addressed, I think it's like pouring water in the sand. And Mr. Alibada, how do you address that? I mean, I guess that is the million dollar question and how do you stop the vicious circle even now when you know Mr. Masba is talking about other groups and you've spoken a lot about Iraq and Syria um, what about the concern the threat of sleeper cells and civilian populations uh, from my political perspective uh, from time to time Syrian democratic forces are blackmailing the European Union if they release all the captives of the ISIL, the ISIL will go to the Europe and again make the terrorist attacks inside the European Union. But what I will explain that if Turkey moves to the east of the European uh, Euphrates River, I do not agree with the Syrian Democratic Forces explanations that ISIS again will gain power in this area because Turkey is the only country who fought with ISIS not by way of air force, but shoulder to shoulder, and killed more than 1,000 uh, ISIL members uh, only in Jarablus and uh, mm -hmm. Aziz, and 2,000 in Ebab city, which is 10% of all it is fighting capacity. And after the Euphrates uh, shield operation, we know that the Turkey created an order, created schools, created hospitals, so addressed to the root causes of the ISIS problem, especially in many different cities of the Syria. So what I believe that fighting with ISIL, with the YPG militia, is not a long-term solution to the problems of the Syrian problem. The long-term solution can only be with can only be possible with the creation of order in this area. Mm -hmm. So the political solution will be the end of the ISIL problem in this Syria, uh, and there is no other solution other than that. So, But I think the problem is that ev everyone agrees that there has to be a political order, but everyone has different ideas of what that order should look like. Mr. Gifford, I could see that you disagreed with some of what um, you heard there. Yeah, well, I, uh, Turkey, at the end of the day, um, is obviously very anti-YPG. It considers it very close with the PKK. And uh, if they were to attack, um, then it would cause a huge amount of violence, of, of which ISIS and other jihadi groups will thrive in. So um, I, I don't, uh, for one second, think Turkey has been a positive uh, influence on this conflict. Far from it. They have been funding jihadist groups within FSA areas and other places uh, from the very beginning. Um, so they um, hold much of the responsibility for the condition that Syria is in right now. And if we are to look to the future, the toxic regional influences that have fueled the violence need to be pushed aside. And we need to take a very pragmatic approach. Who's holding the territory and who's holding it successfully? Who's fighting ISIS? It's groups like the SDF 
IDF, it's groups like the YPG. And with American backing, with European backing, we will actually come up with a, a decent solution to this crisis. There is hope here, but only if we focus on what's working now mm -hmm. and not start talking about uh, renewed offensives by Turkey into Kurdish areas, which and will just cause... A, terrible, terrible violence. And, you know, most people will admit that ISIL has been, been defeated with a lot of help, integral, crucial help from the Syrian Democratic Forces. What role, Mr. Gifford, do you see for them now in we are close to a post-ISIL Syria? Well, the SDF, what their, the greatest asset or the greatest, um, where they're most effective is actually holding the territory. Although ISIS had, there is some limited insurgency, the vast majority of, of the areas around uh, sort of Raqqa and in the north of the country, the 30% of Syria that's controlled by the SDF is actually very peaceful. So peaceful, in fact, that I'll often, I'll go to dinner, I'll go out for, um, meet friends, go out for tea without carrying a weapon. This is, it's a very, um, it, it's a quite a wonderful experience to be in a Syria that's truly decentralized. It shows what the future of Syria could actually be, uh, which is a Syria that, a Syria that is secular, democratic, mm -hmm. where all the different peoples, whether they're Kurds, Yazidis, and Arabs, will all live together in one place. So uh, we just need to realize what, uh, what's effective now. Mm -hmm. We need to realize um, what the local people on the ground want, which is peace now. And they are working very effectively under the SDF banner. So long may it continue as, as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Masba, do you agree that a decentralized Syria is the key to a peaceful Syria? And what needs to happen now to make sure that you know, the military defeat of the group will not be in vain? Yeah, I think uh, a more decentralized uh, uh, way of governance uh, is is very important for Syria for the moment given the uh, the, the divisions inside the country from a sectarian perspective uh, but I think now the first thing is to put a uh, kind of stability in the regions and to make some successful stories to tell to and to emulate uh, on other regions. And I think this is the challenge for the moment mm -hmm. is to make a minimum of stability in some areas. Now we, with the SDF, we will wait and see if it's going to be a successful story. And then uh, we can see if it can be uh, more successful in other parts of the country. And Mr. Alibada, I think we don't have very long left in the program, so I'll give you the last word. How do we capitalize on the gains, the real gains made against ISIL? Uh, what can I say? That I strictly disagree with my uh, counterpart, which is addressing from London. Turkey has no connection with the jihadi groups. It is very clear that Turkey has connection with the opposition, which they claim as jihadists, but they are part of the Geneva peace process. So while we are talking, we should be very clear about what is going on in the terrain. The uh, Syrian Democratic Forces are controlling the group at what expense? I was in the Tel Abyad border just two weeks ago. All the Arabic inhabitants of the Tel Abyad city now is living inside the Turkey. And Tur Turkey is hosting more than 300,000 Kurdish people who is living at the areas where the SDM is controlling. They have escaped to the Turkey just because of the prosecutions of the YPG groups in this area. So if we do not address the root causes of mm -hmm. the problem, we will never be able to solve the problem just in the case of the explanations of my uh, counterparts who is addressing from the London. I can only say that without creating an order which uh, depends to the justice, which depends to the uh, good life of the people, addressing to their needs from the city centers such as Berlin, such as Paris, uh, from far away, but not mm -hmm. accepting even one citizen who is coming right. to, from the Syrian border uh, will not uh, solve the problem. All right, Mr. Alibarda, thank you very much for that. And I'd like to you thank welcome. all of our guests. That is Mohammed Masba in Rabat, Yusuf Alibarda in Ankara, and Mesa Gifford in London. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again at any time by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth with Piranum and the whole team here. Bye for now.